Jesus. So, okay, I think we have everyone. Uh, yeah, just share it back and forth when we get to talking. Uh, so this is going to be our, our last fireside chat of the event, and we're going to talk about the future and trends in virtual reality and gaming, which is kind of what we've all been here talking about anyway. Whether you're developing a game, whether you're investing in a game, whether you're thinking about developing a game or investing in a game, you're making a bet on the future. And we love to look at trends and research and product lines and try to guess what's gonna be the next big thing, but the reality is we don't know. And, and it's been taught over and over that no one knows what's gonna happen especially in the gaming space. So hopefully we'll be able to light a, a tiny bit of a candle here. First off, um, if everyone would like to introduce themselves real quick. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Olusi Narma. I'm the project lead and co-founder of Mindfit Games, a virtual reality-focused studio founded two years ago. Uh, our first product, Pollen, will be coming out this year, 2013. On my free time, I travel to Iceland and run the Finnish virtual reality development groups. Yes, hi everyone. I'm Hannes Högne Willemsson. I'm an associate professor of computer science at Reykjavik University. Uh, and I've been working on a virtual humans for about almost 20 years now in research. And now we're very excited about the virtual reality, although I, I was also excited about virtual reality in the early 90s. But now I'm, again, very excited about it. <laughs> I have my own. I don't know why you gave me my own. <laughs> You're going to regret this. I talk a lot. Uh, I'm Julie. Uh, I'm part of a team working on the VR game Ragnarok. And also, I do a lot of events back home in Copenhagen. Uh, among other things, uh, VR Jam this month, actually. Wait, next month, end May. Um, yes, that's it. I'm Dean Hall, uh, CEO of, of Rocketworks, between, split between New Zealand and London. Um. <clears throat> I'm Hilmar Veo Pietuson. I'm the CEO of CCP. So to get us started, um, to get the negative stuff out of the way, I would like everyone to list something they're afraid of in the future. What might happen in the next five to ten years that would be bad for gaming? What are you afraid we might hit in terms of landmines or things that might trip the industry up? Okay, so my huge fear of the future. I'm an iOS developer on my background, and what I'm really afraid is Steam and, let's say, Steam turning into an app store. It becoming a huge, what is the, Hautausma graveyard of games, like billions of apps and nobody finding anymore anything value of playing, nothing for developers to develop except small copies of something everything else has done, because all of your money is not going for creating a games, but for user acquisition. And that's pretty much what I'm afraid of the most. I don't think that Valve is going to this direction, but... I've already seen pretty much for myself the App Store is at the moment a dead platform. As a gamer, I cannot find anything worth playing on it. And as a developer, if I develop something into it, it gets lost in the void. So I saw already death one of one platform for me. I don't want to see it to happen on PC. Yeah, I think uh, I'm very afraid of uh, basically the overselling the idea of uh, VR again. Um, and then failing at it, and then everyone getting really upset and bored, and then moving on to something else, and not really realizing all the great stuff that we are thinking about today. So, so basically, kind of like failing, basically, and living up to the hype. Uh, if anyone remembers uh, things like Second Life uh, back in the day, and everyone was supposed to move into the virtual world and, and do business there and all of those things. That's all going to come back with VR. Like now everyone has to get in the game, everyone has to open stores in VR and all those things. And then in a couple of years' time, everyone will get really bored and nothing will happen. Uh, and we won't really have a chance to really do the, the real good stuff. So we have multiple people on the panel who were there for VR in the 90s. What is different from the hype then than we're seeing now? Like, is there a market difference in how people talk about VR and get excited about it? Or does it feel like deja vu a little bit? Uh, well, I, I think it feels very different. I mean, when you try it out and you put it on normal people, nobody pukes. So uh, I think that's a, kind of a fundamental thing. Um, but uh, I think it's also, I mean, what I'm mostly interested about is um, what we have learned from making, I mean, back in the, when I started this in 96 and EVE Online and those kind of things, is really, and it was what Dean Hall was <laughs> talking about this morning, which was hugely inspiring. Finally, I've met somebody that gets it. 
<laughs> we, we hugged before. It was quite tender out there. So. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, as uh, two people who have created games where you can die terrible, terrible deaths alone in the great expanse, you must have a lot to talk about. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and there's something fundamental and deep there, uh, which, I mean, we've created in, in two very different games, um, uh, but it's extremely inaccessible because uh, selling people on the reality of, like, your spaceship is real takes a lot of um, time and effort to do. Uh, but there's something about VR where you don't really have to explain it to anyone. You just, you know you're in a spaceship, and the spaceship is real, and if it gets exploded, it's going to hurt. So there is also something different in when we're talking about uh, Second Life and turning all business into VR. I think our kind of fundamental understanding of how to make a virtual world is uh, much more evolved now, at least for me. I, I think I have kind of scratched the surface on how to make a really virtual world. And now VR to me becomes like a, an accessibility of like really getting the point across much quicker than what currently we do in Evaline, which is a lot of sort of long winded complexity and, and sort of, it takes too long. And I just see it in VR, there's like a, a way to short circuit the emotion. So I think that's also fundamentally different from when we were puking with VR 20 years ago. <laughs> I think we can make ex excellent virtual worlds, but we still can't really populate them with um, real people. Uh, NPCs, basically, that behave like real people and can really live up to the expectation that you can really use your own natural interaction way of this face-to-face -face interaction. I think that's still, we still have to live up to that. We're not there yet. So, Julie, I, I, what are you scared of in the next decade of gaming? Um, I'm never scared of anything. Yes, uh, like one thing is, um, so what, what you're talking about is pretty much immersiveness. And, and the, that's like a design question as such. It's a technology question, of course, but it's also a design question of how to actually make people believe that they're in another world. I am a very sort of loner when I play games. I don't actually want anyone in there. And, and there are a few experiences where I felt it was natural that there were other people in the room, but mainly because they were just sneaking behind my back in your demo. That was you. I could see you sometimes. Uh, that's the best thing I've ever tried. That's actually the main reason I'm back, and you know it. I'm just like, can I get back into your demo? Please, you have to go to Iceland, Julia. Okay. Um, but what I'm mainly scared of, and also as a developer, um, like, as a developer in general, when you're doing VR, it's actually a pretty luxurious place to be because all the hardware companies actually want to talk with us because they want our feedback on whatever they're doing, which is amazing. So that's, like, really a steep ahead for any developer who's in VR. But second to that, uh, I fear that the hardware developers are not going to play nice to watch each other. And that's actually going to be a big failure for all of us if people are not playing together. Because what I would prefer as a developer is that we get a de facto standard for like shipping to whatever piece of hardware out there and every device because then we can make one game and we don't have to worry about the whole thing like wait where are you going to ship it on like still none of us know officially when anything is going to be out so like none of us are probably going to be able to say right now uh, in public or not in public which platform we're going to target right because yeah it's really easy to to showcase it on a DK2 because we all have access to that that's fairly easy to get access to but Yet again, like, are we going to push it out on gear? Like, is it going to be Sony Morpheus? Is it going to be Vive? Like, is it going to be Oculus? What are we going to do? Because if those companies start, of course they are competitors, but if they push hard for the competition, it's just going to be worse for us developers. And that's actually what I, what I fear the most. Um, Steam point is, a, is a, like a good point as well, because yes, it is harder as an independent developer with no marketing budget to push things out these days. But at the same time, I think if the hardware developers play nice and help us out and they sort of create some sort of de facto standard, it's going to be way easier for everyone to, to get their stuff out. Because that's the nightmare, isn't it? That you're going to be buying one piece of hardware and you have access to three of the really good VR games. And you have to buy a second piece of hardware to get access to the three other. The, the note about uh, Steam was really interesting. We had an investor up on stage yesterday who was saying, you know, it's going to be a, a relatively minimal install base at first, a very hardcore crowd. Free to play is not going to fly on a virtual reality. He saw it as a downside. I'm at the press area going, that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> like, we have this golden opportunity where no one's going to rush in with free to play. Exactly. And there, it's actually room for premium developers like us, which, which is nice. And also another thing, and that, that might be a tip, I don't know. I, I think it's something I sort of started saying in our team and we're all talking about it, but we're, we're planning to push out uh, episodes 
not a full game. But it's also because we're not done. <laughs> so, and it's easier and it's... Uh, Another thing, and that's a very sort of uh, self-centered thing, but I love working on the game because I love being in VR, and that's the reason <laughs> I'm working on it. So I don't want to let go just yet. And I think actually spitting it out in episodes does make a lot of sense in VR because the install base will in the beginning be fairly small, and yes, there will be a lot of stuff out there that is not necessarily good to play. Um, and that can also scare more people away from actually buying the, any devices. And that's one of my fears, that there will just be bad content in the beginning. But maybe that's just me fearing that. Dean, what are you scared of? Uh, I mean, I, 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 I kind of had my, my answer to that was I, I was going to be scared of, of not having the games that I want to play to be available. But I felt like there was a little bit of a cop-out. And I, I think that when I really think about it, the thing that, that most scares me is that we get so obsessed about some of these new trends, like VR is really exciting because it's tangible. You can see it, it's something you can buy. But for me, um, I'm worried that we start, we, we focus so much on that tangible thing and we get in this arms race again um, to do with graphics. And I think that that actually hurt us over the last five or 10 years because production value costs just skyrocketed with games. And when you spend $100 million making a game, you can't take as many risks. Um, and that's my fear, is that we get into an arms race. And, and, and if you're, so far I've only really seen sort of 10 minute, five minute experiences with VR. What if, uh, you know, how are we gonna meet the high production values that are required when you're doing, you know, HD on each eye? Um, at the same time as provide a 10 minute experience and how are you going to, how are you going to, you know, make that, that fundable and achievable. And do we focus on that while we're missing the revolution that's going on in cloud computing and uh, databasing? Uh, you know, that's what I was talking about. So I guess that's, that's my worry, yeah, that we, we kind of miss, we, we, we get obsessed about what it looks like. So with DayZ, you were able to kind of sidestep the arms race in a lot of ways, because so much of the game was using existing assets. You just layered systems and rules and interaction on top of that. Is that something you also think about with your new games? Like, how do you deal with that now that you're starting from scratch, or seem to be from what you said? Yeah, I, I think I, I looked at going at a very different angle, and I think that, um, uh, you know, I, I think I like what Chet said yesterday about just trying stuff. And so, for me, it wasn't about taking what had been done with DayZ and just doing that again. I mean, that was this is a very cheap way to make a game. <laughs> you know, it gives you pretty good margins. But um, I think that, uh, yeah, I think that trying everything was important. And, and that's, that's certainly my approach, hopefully, to VR is to try stuff. But I do get worried whether we're going to get into an arms race and, and, and who's going to be left with the bill. Because it isn't going to be the customers. It's, it's us, developers. What are you scared of in the next five to ten years in the gaming industry? Um, I think it's hard to be afraid for something five to ten years from now. <laughs> but uh, I would say, I mean, my fear is mostly that uh, there's so much money pouring into VR and it's so embryonic, it's just going to drown out in the, in the egos and the money and the nervousness and, and all the sort of heightened emotions that are around it that we're just gonna screw it up because we, um, we're, we're rushing into something that's gonna really take five to 10 years to really become a thing. I mean, uh, it's, a, it's a lot about VR that reminds me on when like 3D accelerator cards were coming. I mean, it was like tech demos and like it took a while and then it was like GeoQuake and I remember I was programming my first sort of 3D engine thing on a, on a graphics card somewhere in like 97-ish then we released Emo Line in 2003, and we required a 3D card, and that was a massive decision. So from like 97 to 2003, six years, and these were just 3D cards. It's not like, and here we're talking like VR. So I think sometimes we're just trying to collapse the timeline too much, mm. because we know way too much about it. We've been angst about it for 20 years. Now it's finally happening. Uh, any guy with money in their 40s is like taking all their money and dumping into VR somehow, me included. Uh, it's, it's, and wasn't, it's, wasn't it at FanFest you had that uh, lecturer, the space elevator guy, said we tend to 
overestimate what can be done in five years, but underestimate what can be done in... in yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And I mean, that, uh, I mean, any tax disruption is like that. I mean, mobile phones. I remember going to GDC for five years. Mobile phones, mobile gaming, it's going to be big. Nothing happens. Ringtones, we're a bigger business than mobile <laughs> games. Uh, <laughs> then, like, iPhone comes out, nothing happens. Then kind of Angry Birds, damn, class of clans, $2 billion. Uh, and that took, like, 10 years. And that's just a phone. So 3D cars took six years, phone took 10 years, and we sit here about like, whoa, next year, VR is going to be big. Dude, I, I, I thought we were going to publish <laughs> it, it is not going to be big. <laughs> I, I, so when, when, when I, I was the first developer on this game that we're working on, Ragnarok, and I thought it would be out by now. And I was like, yeah, 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 all the devices will be out. So it's cool. Like, VR is a big thing. But I think what's really nice about it is that we're all in this together which means that we're all sharing experiences, and whether it's design, whether it's technology, whatnot, um, because we're learning all the time. And it's fun to, like, I've been in situations where I was called the VR expert. I'm not. <laughs> I just happen to be on stage once in a while. And, and the thing is, in any new field, and that, like, doesn't even have to be the game industry, in any new field, if you're some of the first people working on it and showing your stuff, you easily become the expert of that. Which is, which is interesting because I have no, absolutely no tech background. I just happen to be able to use Unity and try out things. And, uh, and I think that's actually the most important thing. We've been exhibiting our game in VR, like with VR, uh, uh, the head mount display, for one and a half year. And I learned most of what I know about VR from watching people play. And we're constantly changing things in the game. And especially also just getting back to graphics. Like, it is important VR, and it is important to, like, not have too many tries, not have too many draw calls, and just optimize all the time. Performance is key. Like, if you're an asset creator, and you want to do VR, and you guys know, like, I know you are optimizing a lot. I read all your blog posts. Um, and performance is just key, because that's, that's how we're going to make it run on people's computers at home. Like, they will not have a power machine, necessarily. I'm exhibiting on a Mac. Like, Chet, he keeps laughing at me whenever he sees me. Like, get a Windows machine, Julie. Like, no, it's okay. Because the thing is, yeah, I will have jitter, but um, then I make sure that this will be able to run on anything else as well. But that's kind of the grand illusion, isn't it? We look back on mobile or using 3D accelerators, and we kind of think that the tropes were all set, that we had the best minds working on these when they launched. But with any new technology, with any revolution, the first people there are learning as they go. Like, you're doing it, so you are the expert. And it's kind of scary to look back at people who became the experts in mobile and realize they had the same fears. They were sitting there with a touchscreen going, I have no idea how to use this. Let's just get something out. And suddenly they're at GDC talking about how they did it. I mean, CCP has a great reputation in the VR space with games like Valkyrie. Um, I hope you've been able to try some of the VR lab stuff. I, I've talked to a lot of your engineers, and they're like, yeah, we're just in there cranking away and iterating and trying new things and failing way more often than they succeed. Like, it, it's that level of grunt work. Um, to, to become happier a little bit, let's talk about a hope you have for the future in the five years. Something realistically you think is going to happen that's going to make you happy. And let's go in this direction. So, Helmar, would you like to start? Uh, well, uh what I hope um, is that, I mean, for sure, I mean, VR is going to be kind of like I was using 3D accelerators. It's going to be little tech demos, little vignettes, little simple games and all that. But I think the, the real potential is to kind of merge the concepts we're talking about, like Dean was talking about, the, the concept of meaning and difficulty and cruelty and, and, and context and emotions, like what an evil line to a daisy is able to evoke in people. And if we marry that with the kind of emotional accessibility of VR, then I think we have made something truly powerful. But the flip side to that is VR is so powerful because it is so immediate. You feel like you're there. Would Daisy be fun if you actually felt like you were in that environment? Well, I think, I, I think, uh, maybe I think the, the VR things like, almost a little premature, like I find it interesting in that. Like for me, the thing I'm most excited about is the revolution that's already happened in terms of cloud computing and service. So with DayZ, we faced a massive drama about how do we deal with the servers and that. We partnered with the UK company Multiplay to be able to roll up and roll down instances. And I know Hawken did some interesting stuff, didn't quite work out, but with um, how they were spinning up their instances originally. And I think there's just, that's kind of gone on almost unnoticed, and the whole financial industry changed the whole way they did modelings, again, for better or worse, how it worked out. And um, 
with video games, I think there's a lot of people who haven't really touched on that. They've really focused on the GTA Online instance-based experiences without looking at how can we really stitch that together. And for me, that feels so much more immediate. Like, we can do that now. The finan financial industry has been stitching their mod modeling together for a long time. Why haven't we been doing that with video games to stitch together one big world? Um, that's something Eve Online has done for a long time exactly. with a single sh shard universe. Yeah, and it's kind of interesting when you say the financial industry. Um, I mean, Eve Online is really a, a banking system. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, it, and it's kind of, um, I mean, when you live in Iceland, uh, it's kind of a toy economy. Uh, there's a database, uh, it's actually up the street at the central bank, um, uh, where all the money in Iceland is stored, and it's called ISK, used by 300,000 people. Um, and we basically just did that. And, 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 and made spaceships uh, instead of like cars and fish and restaurants and things we have here. <laughs> so, I mean, really, it's a, it's a, it's a banking uh, system. So, uh, and we did that, I think we started 15 years ago. Since then, the world has moved on many cycles. Um, and I think really what Dean is talking about, it's really the, the power is there. Yeah, it's game there. Developers. It's, it's ready to go. It's, we're not uh, waiting for that to go yeah, to the market. Game developers are often so caught up in the, the look of the game, the mechanics, the fun, and all that, in a kind of a isolation and making a puzzle for you to solve. But the real power is in the, in the accessibility of those technologies, which were extremely difficult to make 15 years ago. Mm. Now they're kind of a commodity. And if you, if you combine that with them, um, we are, you have a supernova. Julie, what do you want to see in the next five years? What would make you happy in gaming? I would like to publish our game. <laughs> 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 yes, we're very good at working on it and talking about it and sharing it. Uh, that's one thing, but that's just like selfish. Um, first of all, I, I hope this is going to take off. I've VR, I, I mean with that. So I've been joking about uh, the reason that I work in VR is that I just like in a few years can hide. Uh, in, in a VR mask and don't have to talk to people and don't have to see people. But I, <laughs> I guess that's some of those days where I'm really introverted. Um, a lot of people, like, let's go back to fear, because a lot of people are saying, oh, but then like people might not leave their homes and like video gamers would just sit at home and play. And I look at all the kids today, they're all sitting with their cell phones and playing instead of going outside and playing football. But I don't think it's going to be like that. There will still be social interaction as such, but the things that you can do in VR, for instance, uh, I can't remember who did that, it was in an ad or just like short, about uh, doing experiences for people who won't be able to like travel and see their family. And suddenly you can actually feel that you're surrounded by them. In a few years we can do this panel without us actually being there. And I think we should see it as possibilities and not like fears for the future as such. Um, and I think especially since a lot of the VR devices are now really easy to to mount on people and 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 I've been trying like it on I know you're not supposed to let kids under 13 play it but like my entire family has played it my parents who are over 70 have, have played as well and just the immersiveness and the the way you see people react to it like some people still get motion sick that's a fact I'm one of them but the other thing is that you you can really change people's feel about games with putting them in VR like a lot of non gamers certainly understand why it's interesting. And especially with a lot of the motion control options that are coming out, um, that you don't actually have to be used to, to like using the PS4 controller or Xbox, but you can actually just like wave your hands, like with Leap. And also what you did in the demo that I absolutely love, you can just like take a fireball and throw it on the air and particles will come down on, on your clothes and you just be happy. And, and I think giving people that opportunity is what, what VR is good for. And that's, that's what I'm hoping that more people will, will take to heart. And we're already seeing a, a few things like that on, on the Gear VR, which is Oculus's portable, uh, self-contained VR system you, you plug your phone in. There are these 360 degree videos that are filmed in like Dubai and they're filmed in China and you get these, there's an Iceland one actually that's amazing. And you get these like amazing scenes, you don't have to move or interact. You just look around and you can see whatever you want. So being able to put that on someone who, like you said, isn't into games, and be like, this is what Dubai looks like. And they can explore the environment and it's somewhat interactive. It's amazing and that's the sort of experiences that are really powerful in VR. Uh, what are you hoping we're gonna see in the next few years? 
So yes, I'm very interested in, in what happens to artificial intelligence and actually using VR as kind of a launch pad for a lot deeper artificial intelligence that you can interact with. That gets me back into fears, man. <laughs> wait, <laughs> but wait, wait, there's a positive side to this. And, and yesterday I really loved when you were saying that in VR you really don't want to stab people all the time or shoot people all the time. Uh, so you actually, instead of games just pushing that type of interaction, I think VR is going to call for more deeper interactions with the AI that you're interacting with. So that you're not just shooting them outside, you want to walk up to them and have conversations. You might want to have conversations in VR. Someone um, mentioned pornography. Uh, <laughs> well, I okay. think porn will even be back. Porn will be okay. back. Even Definitely. having sex with them will go old pretty quickly. You will actually want to build relationships oh, with D. them. Yes. Hashtag D. So, so you want, you want <laughs> to really get to know your virtual reality exactly. sexual the partner. People, that's, well, that's It's going to be so there. easy. We don't have so, to date anymore. We can just go in there and like have our partner. Oh, just God. This is, again, we're like right, right back into fears <laughs> for me. <laughs> But I mean, but as, and I'm actually in, in my field, so in, I'm in social AI, that's my field, and I can know that all of the research labs that, that are in my community, they're all rushing out buying VR sets, and now they're all putting their virtual humans in there, and they are basically advancing natural language type of technologies to have interactions in, in real and virtual reality with these characters. I think that's where we're going to see a lot more interest in AI doing something True. than in the gaming industry that really just needs AI to shoot you or, or a hide or something can, like that. Can I second that? So my brother is actually, he's doing AI software for, for video games and he's going to give a talk about AI in VR at mm. this event that, that we're organizing late in May. Um, you should talk. Yes. Hook you up. <laughs> my main problem with AI is that it's expensive because, um, well, from, say, a multiplayer standpoint, you really have to do it on the server. Um, which costs you money. If you do it on the client, they can screw with it. Um, and so, at the moment, it seems for me that using players is actually cheaper um, than, um, than using the AI. So hopefully that's a problem you can solve as well. It's how to, how to do AI in, in a way that's, that's, that's cheap enough, that we can still run it on the server and, and make, make money at the other end. I was here in Iceland about a month ago and I visited some of your former, former students at Alden Dynamics. And it's, they're doing a lot of things that with uh, you know, basic AI and interactions in VR space. And one of the demos they showed me was just a player model. And using positional tracking, you lean forward and she reacted by leaning back and her face kind of scrunched up. That was the entirety of the interaction. And they're like, after you played that, how do you feel? I was like, I feel like a piece of shit. They're like, yeah, just having someone physically react to you getting into their face, you get this visceral reaction like, I am being rude. It's and just that one little animation of someone leaning back gives you such a deep gut feeling that like, even without complex AI, I think people are going to be surprised at the really interesting interactions you're going to be able to have with these NPCs. Yeah, it's like the small things. There's a guy called Tori Kanabe who does excellent demos for VR. One of them is just a person where you're sitting on a coffee table with her and looking at her and at some point she looks at you into the eyes. That feels like, holy Christ, that's, that person is really alive. There's also another one where somebody is just whispering to your ear behind you and all of these kind of small thing emotions. You don't need like a full-blown AI matrix to create a believable virtual environment. It's much easier. So that, that, that's kind of, for me, the question is how much is that worth? Like there's a great book called Blown to Bits and it talks about how Microsoft bought like America Encyclopedia um, and they, for like $100,000 or something, and it used to be this encyclopedia that was sold at supermarket stores. And um, they were like, what can we do with it? And they are like, let's put it on CD-ROM. And it was in Carter. And they were like, let's sell this. And no one wanted to buy it. So they just started gave it, giving it away. And it destroyed Encyclopedia Britannica, this like, I don't know, 500-year-old company or something. And they knew what was happening, but they couldn't do anything about it. And so the question for me with VR is, you know, how it's awesome and it's great, but how, how much is that actually worth to the customer? Because it can end up like mobile, that race to the bottom um, of the experiences. And I think that's... That's the thing that, yeah, we're back in fears again. <laughs> well, I, I think the thing with VR that we have to be very cognizant of is a lot of people, like we were talking about yesterday a little bit, people are like, I'm going to buy the Project Morpheus, and day one I'll be playing Killzone or Grand Theft Auto in virtual reality. And porting existing games is interesting in a few ways, but especially as we've seen with games like Valkyrie, building something from the ground up is so much better. It's a multiplier. So I think hopefully what's going to keep VR from falling into that trap is something built for that art form that can't be done 
on his screen. Like well, we have to be critical, I think. And yeah. I think that's what Valkyrie looked like to me, is that, you know, sat down and said, what, what should we do and what should we not do and learn the lessons? And I think that we just can't keep always getting excited about VR. We have to look at it um, dispassionately and say, what can we really do with this now? What can we maybe do tomorrow? And that's one of the things that scares me when I talk to a lot of VR devs is that whenever they do a Kickstarter or something, like this works on the DK2 and it works on a screen, so you can play it either way. And you kind of have to do that for the market because there are going to be so few people. But I wince a little bit. Like, my rule for VR is if you can make it work well on a screen, you're probably not going far enough into VR. Like, if it's impossible to do on a laptop or a computer, you've done something really, really amazing with VR. And I think that's what you have to be focused on, which is a really hard bet when, it's, you know, for the billions of dollars of investment, no one knows if there's a market for VR. No, and that's also, I guess, that's also why most investors who've been here the past two days, today, yesterday, are a little bit reluctant to going into VR games as such, whereas technology uh, is sort of, I think, a safer bet in a way, and it's more scalable. But at the same time, we're also, it's... I don't feel as much sort of in mainland Europe, but in the US, I know that investors are throwing money after you, just like, oh, you said VR, it's so hyped. We want to be part of this. But the thing is, we can't guarantee anything. And, and also, so we're a self-funded team, which also means we can do whatever we want, right? But yeah, we're working with the same risk and fears because are we going to be able to sell it? Like, or is it just going to be yet another cute demo that's out there, right? We don't know. Also about that doing it only for PC, only for VR, it's, uh... Well, what is VR headset? It's a monitor. It's a moni really good monitor with 360 view. But what you are still doing there is you are using game pads, which is a non-VR control device. For example, in Valkyrie, we can use a joystick, which is perfect because you are using a joystick when you are in a fighter plane. Or if you are doing aero truck simulator, you can use a wheel. And that already exists. But say a first-person shooter game, for example. We don't, now we are having Vive, which is having the handstick controllers, which I think is an awesome idea. That one of the best ways to do controls for VR, but that didn't exist for, say, two years ago when we were starting with the project. At that point, we were just looking like, okay, this is DK1, so what can we do except a roller coaster game? <laughs> <laughs> so that was pretty much like how we started on it. And when we were experimenting, okay, what else could really work on a VR headset? Just a headset, not thinking about the controls at all. We were like, okay, a racing game or a star... Sh uh, Space simulator game would be great. And then we were looking at the market that, okay, do we want to really to compete with Forza and do we want to compete with CCP on Eve Valkyrie? <laughs> and so, so that's how we decided to go first person. It, and it's interesting talking about VR. Everyone talks about Valkyrie as one of the early killer apps in virtual reality. I don't think they're quite aware of how much it was designed with the strengths and weaknesses of VR in mind. I mean, it's a sit-down experience. You have the analog with the sticks and everything. You can model a sit-down body. Did it always begin that way, or was it just kind of serendipity that what your team wanted to do worked so well in VR? Well, I, I think it's a bit of both. I mean, I've, there's always a bit of serendipity involved when you when you do something that's so spot on. Um, but uh, I mean, the I mean, the Kickstarter comes out. We back it as a company. A lot of uh, guys at CCP also back it personally. They get DK twos. And kind of immediately, this notion of using your hat as the joystick becomes the thing. While Kitty is actually more about, I am okay. I have a controller, but it's really looking at things, which is the the the, the killer part of it. Like that's really that was always there. Like sitting and looking and and sort of tracking, and then you kind of when you break that down, okay, really your hat is the input device because we are is a massive input problem. And I haven't really seen anything that kind of deeply connects with, okay, my head is the joystick kind of a, kind of a thing. But that's kind of, and I've, I've seen some of the stuff that the Alting guys are doing, just little kind of cases and like eyeline things and these kind of little extremely subtle things where it's just, okay, I am just using something I'm, which is like deeply intuitive. Then the fact that you're in a cockpit and then you have like surroundings and you feel safe and all that, like make it for a comfortable experience. But I think the killer mechanic was the fact I'm tracking a spaceship and I'm that like that thing was like when I tried it for the first time, okay, apart from the shock of like seeing my body and not being able to move my hands, which was <laughs> kind of deep. And then when you kind of got the, the concept of VR, 
but just to have that sort of natural way of like, I'm looking at the sheer payship and I'm shooting it with my, with my mind, even though I press a button. Uh, I, I think controls are so very important, and I, I guess that we've all spent a lot of time on actually designing controls. Um, so, so I get very nauseous when I play VR. I can only play games where, if I'm moving in them, where I'm moving in the direction I'm facing. Like, I cannot play sort of the um, normal uh, Oculus controls, for instance, from their SDK. And, and we worked a lot around controls. There are also people, if they're more hardcore gamers or if they don't get motion sick, then they prefer to turn the camera on, on the controller. And we actually, we ended up also using control, at least for now. Uh, originally, I used to move controllers, but it was a problem at expos because people would be like flying around hitting each other. So, uh, so I, and, and I really want to get away from the controller as such, like that's my big wish that we will solve in our team uh, within the next six months. Um, because I don't like it because sometimes it ends up being a walking simulator. And who wants to make a walking simulator? I want to make a game, right? And I think controllers are so, like it's such an important feel and a, a topic to talk about in the sense that you have to be immersed and you have to have the controls that feel right. You can fake a lot of things, but as you're saying, actually just being able to look at things and that is the gameplay. Like some of our AI is you're looking at the Yotun and then he follows you because everyone wants to see him and then they get scared, right? And it's just, we found out that everyone, we wanted people to be scared of this character, but they wanted to get closer and look at him. We're like, okay, if you get close, you're gonna die. <laughs> so that was kind of the AI we designed instead. I think this is a good place but for me to say what this my thought about, what is the best thing that I'm accepting in the next five years. So even I, if games were a wine, my vintage year would be 97 when Total Annihilation and uh, Fallout and uh, GoldenEye came out. And in a way I'm hoping that that is something that we are now in the verge of happening again. Not because, only because we are, but because it's such a new platform. It puts the developers rethinking that what the kind of games can be done in the environment. And especially after we get the controls, people will start have to totally forget what they have done earlier and start thinking totally new kind of games. For example, in the Vive demo, you have a tool simulator where you're doing jobs. That is something we couldn't do with a mouse and keyboard or gamepad, but it's something that can be really interesting with 3D controls in VR. Um, it's, that's what I'm the most hyped about. I really want to see the innovation boom up in the next couple of years. Just because uh, Valkyrie came up, and I want to say, you know, one of the things that I think really makes that experience work out, work really perfectly, is the audio engineering. I mean, the audio, the immersion, and the and the soundscape of the experience is really important. And I, I and some of it has to do with also the low frequencies that you're hearing. Uh, they actually kind of like your whole body starts rumbling it with it. <laughs> you can feel the heaviness of the ship. Uh, those things are really done perfectly, and I think those are just as important as the, the head look and the controls and everything. Everything plays together uh, in that experience, and I think that's what sells it. And the fact that there's a big company behind it that knows those things, actually that was a big factor, I think. I don't know if, uh, if, if one developer, like one completely independent developer, would have been able to put all these pieces together. Uh, so we have to kind of help each other out. Um, and I think one of the things that will happen in the future is that we'll get third-party uh, developer tools that will take care of some of these things for us and that will make this uh, accessible to all developers. Great, I, I think that's actually a good place to finish up. I'd like to thank all of you for coming out. I'd, I'd like to thank our panelists here. This was an amazing discussion. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you so much. <laughs>